basically the NPT ended in failure um, over the issue of a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Middle East. That in 1995, the NPT was extended and there was supposed to be a conference on a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Middle East. There are different regions. There's different nuclear weapon-free zone um, processes. And anyway, so it just um, failed it, at the very end. Um, there was supposed to be a conference in 2012, but never happened. And the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. opposed it. So um, we didn't get an agreement at the last hour. So, all right. So I'll just, so this did not happen. We did not eliminate our nuclear weapons. So I just want to get briefly into, um, anyway, all of the initiatives to, um, you know, of all the activists, I basically have all the activists and all the non-nuclear weapon states trying to do everything they can think of to get rid of nuclear weapons. And the nuclear weapon states say that we're reducing our numbers, we're following our commitment, but we're modernizing. And um, so, anyway, all, all these strategies, so we have not been successful after all these years. So the nine dot problem, basically you have to connect the nine dots with four straight lines without lifting up your pen from the paper. So the solution is basically you have to go outside the box. So um, my conclusion is that all, you know, saying how bad weapons are, all the pressure um, demonstrations doesn't deal with the fundamental issue of security. It doesn't answer the question if you say how bad nuclear weapons are or demonstrating against them. Um, so I was bringing in issues of conflict analysis, tension reduction, mediation, nonviolent conflict transformation, that we need to work on the underlying issues, citizen diplomacy, negotiation, conflict, uh, confidence building measures, and uh, that we need a different strategy of weaning ourselves off of nuclear weapons. So one is developing, um, okay, all right. So basically we need to use second order change techniques. First order change is going after the symptom. We need to work on the underlying relationship systems. And this is Mediators Beyond Borders is doing this with the Conference on Climate Change and I'm working on introducing it to the UN. So it's up to us to lift the burden on future generations and psychologists, social scientists, conflict transformation mediator, mediators have a contribution to make. There's a huge void that needs to be filled and we can fill it. So thank you very much and I'm interested in having a discussion with you now. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes for discussion. Um, okay, Floyd. I think she was. Are okay. you very concerned about this whole nuclear agreement with Iran and Iran's tendency to be deceptive uh, Kerry's uh, telling the Arab states, which I think he devalued their anxiety by saying, don't be hysterical. I, for one, am very, very concerned about this, quote, agreement, and I'm wondering what your opinions are. Okay. Um, all right, well, see, I live in Washington, and um, a DuPont Circle near all of the think tanks. So I've gone to many, 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 many meetings on this topic and also at the UN. And the people I know that, that are most knowledgeable that have written books about this, that spend a lot of time in going to, traveling to Iran, think that it's the best possible deal, that it's, that it's a good thing. And also, if we don't have a deal, then they'll definitely, um, um, you know, escalate and build nuclear weapons. So. Uh, the other thing is that Iran, it's not a blanket thing, and that you have the old guard. You have a lot of young people that a majority, that they have a very youth bulge, or a high number of young people. They're also very highly cultured, educated. Women have more education and freedom there. And, and part of this, they just want to be normal country. They want to rejoin the West. They're, they're interested in that. A lot of them love Americans. Um, and also, this is like how things get better. There's an opportunity to reduce tension, and if they develop, that we could work with them on other things. It's, I mean, there's also very, very, the most intrusive inspections ever. But the people that are the most, absolutely the most knowledgeable, I see your concern. And there's a lot of black, there's a lot of black and white 
thinking about that it's not a monolith. The, the Ayatollah just said that he would not allow inspections of military areas. Now France is concerned, I'm watching this extremely closely, and I am very, very concerned. All right, so. Um, <laughs> personally and professionally. And do you think we should not have the deal? I don't think we should have that deal. No, we should have a deal. Absolutely. I wrote to Obama two years, you know, in November 2013, stating absolutely no enrichment, no centrifuges. There should be no sanctions at all, peace and prosperity for Iran, peace of mind for the end of, for the rest <laughs> peace of mind for the rest of the world. And I said, you know, just make the trade then and there, keep it simple, no ambiguity. The Iranians are going to take advantage of ambiguity. It was written up December 4th, 2013 that, you know, that's why they, um, they, they uh, do emotional abuse of prisoners because they'll take, you know, they'll use communication as a weapon. And I, I'm sorry, I don't want to take the time, but I'm very, very... Okay, well, I think... What do they say? Now mistrust, but verify. And also, it's not June 30th yet. We don't know what the final. No centrifuges. No. Okay, we don't. We don't know what the final agreement is yet. For I mean, one of the things I wanted to mention is, um, in the in the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, which Iran signed, it says in there that they have the inalienable right to enrich uranium. Yes. So if you'd like Iran not to do that. First, United States, Europe, and places have to withdraw themselves from that treaty. Because in that treaty, they agreed that Iran can enrich uranium. That they've agreed already in the treaty. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out is William McDougall, the founder of social psychology, in his, in his 1930s when he's old, he was writing books against war. And in 1934, he said, if we make a nuclear bomb, the existence of humanity is in peril. So that was more than a decade before the bomb was made. So there was something in the air, even in the 30s, that a psychologist knew that a nuclear bomb could be made. Wow. Well, that's never in the history. Um, and the peril now is even worse than it was in the Cold War for several reasons. One is the US is building anti-missile systems, right? David Parnas, when Reagan first proposed Star Wars, David Parnas was the US computer engineer in charge of the software for Reagan's Star Wars. And after about a month, he withdrew and became a major anti-Star Wars speaker. And his argument is this, the, the software, big software systems, never work when the user gets them. And he, people say, what's my date? He puts up an enormous zero the size of your globe. He said, this is the number of software systems that work when the user gets them. It's never happened, ever. So he said, we cannot trust Star Wars software until we have 10 or 20 practice nuclear wars. <laughs> and since we can't do that, it means we can never trust the anti-missile system <coughs> software works. So he said, the logic then becomes, each side does worst case scenario planning. So the American side is, the worst case scenario is, our defense doesn't work. So we need to make missiles to go against, to, to survive attack. The Soviet side, their worst case scenario is, the, new, the missile system works. So they've got to overwhelm it by having a lot of missiles. So you, your argument about, why make a lot of missiles is it part of it is to overwhelm a defense system. So he said if if we build these anti-missile systems, all that's gonna do is accelerate an enormous arms race. Each side will then start accelerating because someone tried to make an anti-missile system. Okay, so point of order. I just wonder how many other people with a quick show of hands would like to say something or have ask a question. Uh, okay, so we're running out of time, unfortunately, so what I'm going to do is ask uh, these two people to pose their questions, and then you can respond to all of okay. them. Okay. Yes. Any studies uh, by anybody in the last 50 years on the psychology of the Japanese um, ending uh, 
gunpowder uh, in the last in, in 300 years from the time gunpowder was introduced mm -hmm. in Japan. Uh, do you, are you familiar with them? Yeah. Uh, 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 could you say something about this? There's a book on it. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, I would like to hear about that. Then. There's a book on it. It's called Banning the Gun. It's a short little paperback. It's how they got rid of guns until Commander Perry opened it up again. And then, of course, they got it <coughs> to Japan. So there is there is a study on it. Yeah. It's yeah. psychologically well and historically the mechanism by which the the shogunates managed to uh, get rid of the gun was by giving imperial uh, permission and then not giving it to the sons. So father could fix guns, but the son couldn't. And so eventually, nobody knew how to make guns or how to make bullets. And so the gun disappeared for about a little while. And then, of course, Commander Perry brought it back in. Um, I have a quick question about your comment about the young people in Iran. I, I read that same material. I'm wondering, though, given a patriarchy, given that it's a Shiite country, given that old men are running that country, isn't it a little excessively optimistic to think that 20 and 30 year olds are going to get into power, what, in another 30 years to make any difference there? I mean, everything you said is, is right, except you're not, I think, taking into account the gerontocracy that's ruling Iran. That's who we have to deal with, not the young people. Okay. Well, the people I know who spent time there, in the country, there's not just one, or there are two Irans. There's that element, and then there's young people and the culture who were on the internet and who want to be normal. Well, and they're not, not running the country. Right. 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 right, but the old guard, well, I mean, all right, so we're, we're in a, so to answer they your- They glorify death. They, they will be, they, <coughs> Okay, so we need to wrap up. Well, I, I, I think you have to ask, who, who's running our country? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not the common person. It's could, big could money. Could you explain the question, please? It, okay, well, I, mean, I mean, that's, that, that's your point is, who's running Iran? Yes. Well, who's running our country? Uh, and well, it's, we, it's, we, it's, we it's the, people, well, not we, really. I mean, it's... it's Big corporations well, control everything, yeah, yeah, and so, so, still, so the young people that want peace, the power, they can't. We can put a 42-year-old president into power, John F. Kennedy. They can't. They can't. They're stuck with their mullahs at the top. Is that not true? Yes. Yes. So, all right. Just finally, there's a dynamic. Between them, I have thing <clears throat> I call the political Heisenberg principle in physics. The Heisenberg principle. I'll end on this. Yeah. Is that you can't observe a phenomenon without looking, considering the effect of the observer. So if I set up a physics experiment to see whether light is a particle or a wave, if I set up the experiment one way, it's a particle. If I set it up another way, it's a wave. So you know we. Um, there were a million Iranians having candlelight vigils for us after 9-11. They helped us with intelligence with Al-Qaeda. Then Bush called them the axis of evil. They had a proposal, a peace initiative in 2003 that Bush completely ignored. So we have a history of um, failures of communication, of missing each other in times when uh, we were trying to do something. So, you know, in terms of, you know, whether the enemy is static or dynamic, that we need to work on, you know, we could do like citizen diplomacy, reduce tension, do more communication, and um, the more threatening and provocative we are, the more we're going to drive, escalate tension and drive behavior that we're afraid of. So we have to do whatever we can to work on mediation and, I mean, they're difficult people, but you don't want to um, make it worse. Right. Okay, thank you.